It's time for another edition of Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. And to do that, I introduce you to my partner, and he is Mo Moten, senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com. You can follow him on x.com. I got a lot of .coms in there. At M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. And I am Scott Branson, your host as well. You can follow me on X as well. LV Gully is the handle. The show is SNB Today. Uh, Mo, wow. Sunday. Raiders. No points. Um, three to nothing loss. As I told Murph on the post game, I finally know what it's like to cover soccer. Right? I mean, <laughs> three yeah. to nothing. It You can't get those three hours of your life back. Uh, there's no question. But I think that there's a lot of things to talk about here, and a lot of them are very obvious. Uh, and I think that for for those people who cover their team, and I know a lot of a lot of folks out there, not necessarily our listeners or viewers, uh, a lot of folks out there like to pit the media against the fans and all this jazz and all that. We're not here to do that, but I will say that I think overall it's it's a pretty easy assessment of what's going on with the Raiders. Dave, and I've said it, and I've gotten criticized in the past. The Raiders lack some talent in key areas, no question about that. And we'll talk about some of those today. Uh, but then also at the coaching position, they fire their coach. Antonio Pierce is the interim head coach, comes in, wins two games, and now he's lost three in a row. Under, I want to set the stage here, Mo. When Josh McDaniels was fired as coach, the offense was averaging a paltry 16.5 points per game. Since that time, since Pierce took over, made Aiden O'Connell the starter quarterback, which we all degree, agreed was the right decision, they've now dipped to 15 and a half points. So they've actually gotten worse in five games since Josh McDaniels is gone. Um, look, it's not about it's not about <clears throat> defaming the man or 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 not appreciating what he did and stepped into a difficult situation. But when you look at what's not working for the Raiders, you have to look at the coaching. You have to look at the players, and pr primarily for me, you have to look at the quarterback position. Uh, things just aren't going the, the direction that the Raiders need to do what is the point of the entire operation. The point of the Raiders is what Al Davis said and coined the phrase, which is just win, baby. Okay, They are not winning. They are not competitive. People say they're competitive, Mo, because they lost three to nothing. They had no first downs in the second half. And they had eight first downs in the entire game. This is, while maybe not as bad as the Carolina Panthers, it's in that range. They can't score points. They are at 29th in the league. Uh, I'm just, I guess I'm struck by some folks just not seeing what I'm seeing. You know why some folks don't see what you see, Scott? Because they're fans because and they're loyal and I get it. Because some of them, not all of them, some of them want Antonio Pierce to be the head coach by any means necessary. So they're reluctant to point out some of the faults with this team because they know that that's going to go on on Antonio Pierce's resume as he's applying or interviewing for the head coaching position. I, I just want to say this, right? And I put this out on the X. No matter you know how much you like Antonio Pierce, love Antonio Pierce, and I, I'm not putting this loss all in on Antonio Pierce. But as the head coach, you're in a CEO-type position. You cannot say, oh, it's not Antonio Pierce's fault. It's all Bo Hardigree's fault because he's the offensive play caller. No, that doesn't fly because I, I've listened to plenty of press conferences with John Harbaugh. When the Ravens don't play well, he gets on the podium and says, I'm the head coach. I have to get my team ready. Mike Tomlin is not a play caller. When the Steelers lose embarrassingly like they lost against the Patriots on Thursday, he gets he steps to the podium and says, my fault, I'm the head coach. To Antonio Pierce's credit, he didn't skirt responsibility. I'm not blaming Antonio Pierce because, remember, no. we got on Josh McDaniels for not taking accountability. Correct. Antonio Pierce takes accountability. That's Every not time. my criticism. My criticism is of people who are willing to give him the out, the escape rope to say, it's not Antonio Pierce because he's not a play caller. And I say that's BS because he is the head coach. When you're a head coach, when you're leading a company, you can't, if someone asks you, well, how are sales for your company for the month of December? You can't say, well, I did my job, but this department over here didn't perform well, but that wasn't me. That was that department. No, you're running the whole operation. 
that department is under you. So you you have to take responsibility for that as well. So for the people willing to give Antonio Pierce an out there, doesn't make any sense. Stop giving him excuses. That's number one. Number two, I'll say this really quick, Scott. Mm -hmm. I understand the Raiders have a first-time play caller. I understand they have a rookie quarterback. But in that game against the Minnesota Vikings, the Minnesota Vikings made a quarterback change in the fourth quarter when it's still 0-0. They went to Nick Mullins. The Raiders had a chance to go to Jimmy Garoppolo, a more experienced quarterback, who, can count, who, who, in my opinion, can counteract some of the inexperiences of your play caller. So Jimmy Garoppolo can get to the line and make some changes because he's seen a lot more than Aiden O'Connell, where Aiden O'Connell may be more handcuffed to the play call because he's a rookie still learning on the job. Remember, you brought this up in a previous show. You, you, you posed this question. At what point do the Raiders go with Jimmy Garoppolo? And I said, you got to ride it out, right? But if it's 0-0 zero, zero, and you're fighting for your, your playoff lives – and Aiden O'Connell isn't doing much, and your offense is producing a goose egg. That is the one situation where I say, well, maybe you throw in Jimmy Garoppolo. Also because the Vikings haven't prepared for Jimmy Garoppolo. They prepare for Aiden O'Connell. So you can kind of catch a defense off guard by bringing in a quarterback they didn't primarily prepare for during the week. Correct. And that does not mean that you go to Garoppolo there late in the game against the Vikings and then – Start him the next week. That's not that's not exactly. what the exactly. point was. The point exactly. was exactly. to get a change of pace. What you were doing was not working. The door said pull and you kept pushing. So <laughs> so do you do something different or do you keep pushing the door? Antonio Pierce kept pushing the door. And after the game, the, guess what the first question was from the media was? Was did you consider going to Jimmy Garoppolo? I'm going to quote Coach Pierce. No, poor performance coaching starts with myself, starts with the coordinator, quarterback, and so on. Just bad overall. Second question, no inclination to go with Jimmy Garoppolo? Coach Pierce will eval evaluate everything going forward. So I don't know what that means. Does that mean he's considering Jimmy Garoppolo starting? I don't think so, but we'll see. Now, the other thing is, to your point about people making excuses and, and wanting Coach Pierce, who is a good dude. Mm-hmm. So don't come at me with crap about not liking Antonio Pierce. They asked him about how the offense has regressed and how it regressed during a bye week. And he said, quote, no excuse there. It's shocking. Plenty of time to prepare for their opponent. We knew what they did. Nothing new. Just again, poor coaching, poor performance by the players. And it starts with myself. So to your point, and, and he's a he's a man. The, he's a man. He's, he's exactly what you want in a man, which is when you don't perform well, you take responsibility. Mm -hmm. He took responsibility, but yet people, mm -hmm. folks out there, some of our listeners who I love our listeners, even when we disagree, are out there defending it and saying it's not his fault when he says it's his fault. So I, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and I think it's crazy. The man himself is admitting it, but yet people don't want to admit it, which is fine. But I will say this. That if you look at what's happened, the head coaching, and, and Murph and I talked about this in the postgame show. Murph was talking, well, not all the coaches know X's and O's and all that, but yes, they have the, the game plan. Okay. The game plan. Yes, you're not, maybe you're a defensive coach like Antonio Pierce, and you're not as familiar with offensive schemes as, let's say, an offensive minded coach. That's fine. That's why you have your coordinator. That's why you have position coaches. That's what you do. It, but it's, it's your response to your point. You can't blame a bad quarter if you're a public company on your marketing department and get away with it. It's your responsibility. There's mm -hmm. a sign on your desk that says the buck stops here. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and deficiencies in players, not having this person, not having that person, doesn't matter. Antonio Pierce was given a nine-game audition, period. He accepted it, by the way. He walked in knowing that team better than any of us do. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that... It just thus far does not look good for him, especially after this game. I think this really – any chance that he had – and I, of course, he's still going to interview for the job, Bo. But any chance that he had at this job, I think, got a lot slimmer after a 3 to nothing loss, the first Raiders shutout, them being shut out since 2012. Scott, there's just no excuse for an offense going into the bye week struggling and then coming out of the bye week on the other side being worse. That in itself is an indictment on the coaching and execution. And Antonio Pierce owned it, and he should. Mm -hmm. So to his credit, we're, again, we're, I'm not criticizing Antonio Pierce for lack of accountability. No. He's taking accountability. 
I'm talking to the people who are trying to give him a pass for the Raiders offense or the Raiders team, not look, not just offense, but the team defense is playing well, but to produce three, to produce nothing, zero points after knowing your, after having two weeks of preparation to, to, to game plan for the Vikings. And I know the Vikings didn't have a great outing either, but the Vikings had 16 first downs and the Raiders had eight, eight first downs. And as I said, Kevin O'Connell, the Vikings head coach, made an executive decision to put Nick Mullins out there, and it worked for them because it got them in field goal range so they can win the football game. At the end of the day, you're just trying to win football games. Here's the other excuse I saw, right? Oh, they don't want to put Jimmy out there because Jimmy has the injury clause where, where if he gets hurt, Raiders are on the hook next year for his money. And, and to that I say – these coaches don't even know if they're going to be there next year. You think they're worried about some dead money carrying over to 2024 when they may no. need, they may not even have a job next year. Correct. You can't plan for next year when you don't know if you're going to be there yourself. Right. You're trying to win football games. That's the bottom line. You're trying to win games right now to preserve your job so you can come back next year. Right. And and I saw some other folks talking about, well, it doesn't matter. Just stick with O'Connell because we're going to lose anyway. I don't understand that. I get it. Listen, the Raiders will be in a position in the first round to get a good draft pick, and they have to. I, by the way, yesterday, Vinny Bonsignor and the RJ wrote a great piece about how this team has to get a quarterback. I mean, um, duh. It, it was... <laughs> I mean, a lot of us have been saying, including fans, have been saying for two and a half years that you need a quarterback. So, but what's the water under the bridge? So you have to go get a quarterback. Oh, but you need an offensive line. You need, and you do. You win in the trenches too. But this league, if you saw yesterday, <laughs> yesterday was a perfect example. I mean, as we record this on Monday, Sunday's game, if you look at it, if you had any kind of quarterback play, you win that game. Plain and simple. Aiden O'Connell held the ball too long. We're going to get into him in the next in the next uh, segment. But I, again, I, I, I. Antonio Pierce isn't blaming anybody. He's not blaming his offensive coordinator. And some of you will say, well, that's he's not going to get up there and say that. No, but Josh McDaniels deflected it the whole time he was there. So that yeah. tells you Antonio Pierce knows. He knows exactly. And look, watching Coach Pierce during the games, good dude. I mean, he tried to fire up his thing. He This whole got to start the second half like it's the first half. Well, you didn't do well in the first half either. And then they come out of the locker room six minutes before the start of the half even TV called it out and said, this is really weird. I've never seen this before. So I give Antonio Pierce a lot of credit for trying things. He's trying to mm -hmm. get this unit to think differently, do things differently. You got to give him credit for that. At the same time, it's just not working. And don't talk to me about player. Players want him. They want him so bad that they couldn't score a point on Sunday. Like they couldn't execute. They looked like they all just rolled out of bed like I did before recording this show. Right. So you don't all of that feel good. Ooh, let's put a blanket out and get some cocoa. It's not going to work. It's about wins and losses in the NFL. Mm -hmm. It's about results. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, like I said, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to turn this into an Antonio Pierce. This is not an Antonio Pierce bashing, bashing no. session. I want to make that clear nope. because I give Antonio Chris, as you said, for trying something different. As you said, the broadcast point out that the Raiders came out early at a halftime. And it's clear that Antonio Pierce was trying to spark something in his team. They also showed Antonio Pierce gather around the players where he was giving an emotion, a motivational, emotional speech. And and trust me, that stuff carries in the locker room. It strikes a chord with some players. It does, but it's not everything. And and it, it, as you said, it boils down to wins and losses and game planning. It. Murph talked about X's and O's, and now coaches know X's and O's. You better know X's and O's if you're a coach in the NFL. Because that's what it's going to come down to. When you're game planning against Andy Reid, against Sean Payton, against Kyle Shanahan, you better be able to know what to do when they have their game plan out there, how to counter, because you're playing checkers while they're playing chess if you don't. So yeah, and, the motivational what, speeches – sorry, Scott, but the no, motivational speeches and the vibes are great. It changed the locker room. It, it uplifted the vibe of the locker room, and that took the Raiders two immediate wins, which is fine. But after that, where did they go from there in it? And it's plateaued and in some sorts regressed for them. Correct. Yeah. I mean, especially with the offense. But but you look at that and you say, listen, um, 
if you don't win, that's, I mean, it's about wins and losses. We just said that over and over again. But at the same time, I will tell you, the people who I've talked to who say, well, but they've been competitive. Look at the scores of the game. Are you not watching the same games? Because it doesn't matter if the score is close. And by the way, they lost. The Chiefs put 31 up on the Raiders. Okay, then you go back to the Miami game. Well, we stayed close to Miami. You stayed close to. It doesn't matter. You have to be able to finish. Your offense couldn't move the ball, couldn't score. Still can't score. So that, it's not, it's not like they're losing games like you saw yesterday in Baltimore. Now there's the Rams. The Rams aren't very good either, but the Rams pushed the Baltimore Ravens into overtime and they lost on a kickoff return. That's the, if the Raiders were doing that, Mo, that's a very different kind of losing. Do you agree with me on that? Do you see the nuance there? Yes, because the Rams are actually scoring points. <laughs> they don't look inept on offense. Now right. they have a an, they have an offensive mind as the head coach of Sean McVay, but sure. it kind of underlines my point that this is why you open up the head coaching search because what if the Raiders had a head coach who was also an offensive play caller? He could change things on the fly. He would have more leverage in changing things on the fly because he's an offensive mind. Whereas Antonio Pierce, very limited in his offensive knowledge and game planning. I'm guessing. So then it's more on Bo Hardigree. And that's my point about hiring the best candidate. In this situation against the Vikings, don't you wish the Raiders had an offensive mind as a head coach? Because then, again, he can make changes on the fly, as Aiden O'Connell did going to Nick Mullins. Whereas Antonio Pierce may be slow to change as a defensive-minded coach who's a, who was a linebacker's coach. So, again, it goes back to my idea that this is why we don't give people jobs with a four-game sample size. This is why we don't give people jobs after going 2-0. You wait till the season plays out and you see the results and then you make the best decision among the candidates who want the job. I don't think it should be any more simple than that. Mo, what do you say if, if someone came up to you and said, hey, Mo, just give them a good offensive coordinator. One of the, go get one of the bright young minds out there to be the offensive coordinator and let him be head coach. To that, I say, do you understand that if your offensive coordinator is good, he's going to have to have a revolving door at OC every two to three years? The other thing is, why are we giving Antonio Pierce the job <laughs> when we should be interviewing people and getting the ideas of other candidates who are or are play callers themselves? Why are we putting Antonio? Now, he's got the job for now. But just giving him the job and say, oh, he just needs an OC. We don't know that. We don't, we, we don't know that. And that's why you open up the head coaching search and you cast a wide net to see who the best candidates are. Because if Antonio Pierce hires a guy and he's no good, then what? Yeah. Then what? Then you're going to have to go through another cycle of hiring again. And that's why I say this is why I, I understand the people who say hire a head coach who's also got some offensive play calling background. Because then, like the Philadelphia Eagles, I know they're struggling right now. Because then, even if you lose your OC – your head coach has some knowledge to keep that offense steady versus being at the mercy of an OC that you may not, that may not have a long track record. Yeah. To close out this segment, the discussion on, on coach Pierce, I, I, when I was talking to Murph on Sunday night too, I, I brought up this point, which was because Murph said something and it really caught my ear, which was about, Hey, he's learning. And you know, he had this conference call with Tom Coughlin and Marvin Lewis. And I forgot who the third coach was. Oh, Adam Gase. Adam Gase. Oof. So, so he has a call. He, 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 they were involved in team meetings, and I saw it kind of written as a positive. I did not look at it as a positive. I know Tom Coughlin is a mentor to him, and like I, that's great. And we all have mentor. Mentorship is massive. You know this, Mo. You do it for young writers. The whole thing. But when you're talking about game planning and running a team, you got to be able to do that yourself. You have to be able to take charge of it. I know we've said that over and over again, this segment, but that's the trouble I see too, is I don't see, I saw on the field, I saw the raw, raw speech was just great. I saw the coming out from halftime. Great. Tried new stuff. But what I didn't see was I, I, I did not see a coach on the sideline who situationally seemed to be plugged in again. It's just, it's just because you haven't done it before. He was not a coordinator before he was a linebackers coach. If this was Patrick Graham, who doesn't have a ton of experience either, by the way, only a few years as a DC, you could understand it. Lastly, 
offensive core. Just bring in an offensive coordinator. You're assuming that one of the hottest offensive coordinators in the league wants to come work for Antonio Pierce. We don't know that. Antonio Pierce has his relationships, I'm sure. But when you're talking about, does an offensive coordinator want to go to a team that's piecing together a coaching staff where he doesn't have a quarterback yet? It, head coaching jobs are different than coordinator jobs, right? So head coaching job in the NFL, there's only 32 of them. Offensive coordinators, yeah, same thing. But as you said, they move around, especially if you're hot. So people are assuming that you can just go out and get the best offensive coordinator, and that's going to help Antonio Pierce be a successful head coach. And that, I think, belies the whole point of what a head coach does as CEO on the field and how he's got to be tapped into everything going on. Newsflash, Ben Johnson ain't going to be the OC under Antonio Pierce. He's going to go for a head coaching job. So, right. and that, that's, Frank that's Smith, the under, all candidates. Right. That's the underlying your point is that you, I think people just assume that you could just snatch a, a quality offensive coordinator up and, and he'll go on board and be with it when he can get a head coaching job. It, it just doesn't work like that. And that goes back to my point about, go ahead, Scott. No, or relationships. Like, so, so again, if I'm looking at it, for example, they're going to have a new staff in Carolina and you could say what you want about Bryce Young, but you have Bryce Young. So if I'm an offensive coordinator and I'm looking to get my first OC job, which is my step to be a head coach, do I want to go there or do I want to go somewhere like the Bears, if they have a new staff who Justin Fields, yeah, he's been up and down and people aren't convinced or whatever. But if they commit to him or if they get a new quarterback, I'm going to go there because now, hey, I'll have Caleb Williams or I have Drake May. Yeah, I'm going there versus the Raiders have Aiden O'Connell at this point. So now I know they could draft somebody too. But my point is you, you, the job for an offensive coordinator is not as appealing as it is for a head coach at this point with the Raiders because – I, your relationship with the head coach also matters. Now, maybe Antonio Pierce knows some whiz kid offensive coordinator somewhere. I don't know. I, I'm not, he was a position coach. He wasn't a coordinator where he had to put together a staff, and that's another big issue. So anyway, that's right. Did you have something to say before we go to break, Mo? Yeah, I was going to just put out one scenario for Raider fans listening to us out there. Would you rather have a head coach who hires a new face, a fresh new blood at, at, as an offensive coordinator, or would you rather have a head coach who has an offensive coordinator or offensive play calling background who hires an offensive coordinator? That mm -hmm. way, if you lose again, if you lose, that goes back to my point. If you lose your offensive coordinator, you still have your head coach who has that play calling experience. If your offensive coordinator stinks, your head coach can always just take over. If you keep Antonio Pierce and your offensive coordinator stinks, guess what? You're stuck with Antonio Pierce who doesn't call plays offensively and an offensive coordinator who stinks. So yes. that's my point is that you want to cover all your bases because the Raiders have to get this right. They're going to draft a quarterback, so it's very important that they get an offensive play caller who's pretty good because they're going to have – look at Bryce Young Carolina. People are already saying the Panthers are ruining Bryce Young because of the operation they put together. So assuming the Raiders are going to draft a quarterback early in the draft, and they are, trust me. I'm not sourcing that, but it's pretty obvious they should. <laughs> they better get the offensive play calling position right. You cannot take chances with that if you're grooming a young quarterback. Yes. All right. We went long on this segment, but that's okay. We had a lot to say. We're going to take our first break here on Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Aiden O'Connell. We're going to talk about the quarterback who did not have a good day on Sunday, but we'll talk about his future. And Mo and I will, again, educate you guys on the fact that the NFL has changed. It's not 1990. And pocket passers, sorry folks, pocket passers who are statues are not going to help you win in the NFL anymore. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. We'll talk to you about that when we come back here on Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Segment number two here on Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition. Mo Moten, Scott Colbranson with you. We are talking Raiders football. Do us a favor, please. Also subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Just look for Silver and Black today. Hit the subscribe button. Put the auto download on, by the way. That way, every time we do a show, <clears throat> it comes right to you. You don't have to worry about any of that. Also, a hello to our audience on YouTube and in the chat. We appreciate you subscribing there and also hitting that notification bell so that you are notified when we have new videos. Okay, we talked about the coaching situation with the Raiders. Now we're going to talk about the offense. We'll get into the quarterback in a second. But I, I, it's amazing to me that people have such recency bias. The Raiders under Josh McDaniels, as I said in the first segment, Mo, has scored a terrible 
average of 16 and a half points per game. It was embarrassing. So the first two games they come back out uh, still are not an offensive juggernaut, but things look like they're going better. Aiden O'Connell plays pretty well. They win two games in a row. And then now you've been on this three-game losing skid. The Raiders have regressed terribly. The Raiders now are scoring 15 and a half points per game after they were shut out against the Vikings. And I, I was talking to a, a listener of ours, uh, direct messaging, and he says, I can't believe you think the offense is worse. And I said, what do the numbers say? I said, I'm not trying to be a jerk. The numbers show it's worse. So why is it that you as a fan, and I was saying this respectfully, we weren't arguing. As a fan, why are you telling me it looks better? Well, because, you know, Josh Jacobs was right. Josh Jacobs didn't run well yesterday, and he got hurt. So hopefully he's okay. We'll get a report on Wednesday. But it, it, it's almost like mass hypnosis has occurred, Mo. Because, I mean, obviously the Vikings game, nobody's going to defend because you scored zero points. But overall, you've seen the offense have moments. No question it's had moments. And you've had moments with Aiden O'Connell. But this offense... As I said, I did a quick video before the game on Sunday, and I said, hey, one of the keys to win for the Raiders is to stay aggressive on offense. You have to attack that Minnesota defense. You have to attack the defensive backs. A little inexperienced. they got a couple good ones back there, but they're also young. And they're good against the run, right? So you you have to attack, 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 attack. So what do the Raiders do? They come out on the first drive, and they kind of do that a little bit. Eh, a little bit. And then they just go away, and they become very vanilla again. So... I'm not surprised. You can blame Bo Hardigree, but here's the deal. We talked about head coach is responsible. No question, Mo. But also, people are willing to give a pass to the head coach because he has no experience. <laughs> but the offensive coordinator who never had play calling experience in his career, he's terrible. Fire him. So I, I'm having trouble kind of putting those things together. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> but you know that the the reason and I'm just saying not playing not even playing devil's advocate, but this is what people will say. People will say, well, Antonio Pierce changed the locker room and helped elevate the Raiders to those first two wins against the Giants and Jets. But Hardigree didn't do that or can't do that because he's not, you know, he's not in a leadership position. So that's why they'll give Antonio Pierce the pass. Also, he's from Compton. I don't know if you remember remember that or know that. <laughs> Antonio Pierce is and from Compton, grew up a Raider. Impala. Yeah, and he and he wear he wore cool Raider jackets in one of these college games. I don't know if you saw that, <laughs> but he he looked pretty cool in that jacket. I'm just saying. Yeah. But Hardigree didn't wear Raider, a, a nice Raiders jacket, and that you know can't can't have that. But it, in all seriousness, though, to your point about Josh Jacobs, had a couple of had a couple of good games in a row as soon as Antonio Pierce took over. Two of his last three games, he's been under 40 rushing yards. Now he ran for about a buck ten against the Chiefs. But as but as if you watch that game, you know that the Raiders' offense basically fizzled out after the the, the first quarter. <laughs> so yeah, he had sixty three I mean, yards on one run. Yeah, exactly. And then he had more than half of those yards on one run, as you pointed out. So while I, while a lot of people see the progress, I think people are caught up in seeing the progress in Aiden O'Connell before Sunday's game, of course, and saying, "Well, before the bye, Aiden O'Connell was showing his signs of improvement." And we talked about that. That Aiden yes. O'Connell is actually improving. But now, after on the other side of the bye, he, I, I believe that was probably his worst outside of the fumbles in the Chargers game. His, you know, his first start, I, that was his worst outing. There were I talked about it there in my Blue Report live. There were a lot of yards he left on the field, a lot of misfires. There were some bobbles. Trey Tucker bobbled the pass that should have been caught in bounds, and uh, I believe the refs overturned it. There was I think Michael Mayer or someone else. Or Jacoby Myers had a bobble where they should have brought in the pass. That's not on Aiden O'Connell, but there were, were multiple. Multiple scenarios where Aiden O'Connell just completely missed the wide receiver, where he just either didn't see the wide receiver. And this goes back to my point about having a naturally mobile quarterback. When Aiden O'Connell was on the move, he missed receivers. Tashawn Reed, the athletic, pointed it out. Vinny Bunsenior, the Las Vegas Review Journal, pointed it out. Other Raiders reporters pointed it out. There were times where Aiden O'Connell had to move out of the pocket because pressure was coming after him. As we know, Brian Flores likes to send blitzes. So Aiden O'Connell had to use what mobility, what, what little mobility he had, he had to use it. And when he used it, he wasn't always the most accurate. And that's what I mean about having a functionally mobile quarterback. It's not about rushing yards. 
People came at me this past week and saying, oh, the Raiders don't need a functionally mobile quarterback. Look at Lamar Jackson. He gets hurt. Look at some of these guys. They get hurt. It's not about rushing yards. They brought Justin Fields, too. It's not about rushing yards. Being fun. I'm going to define it. For all the people listening to this show and listen to me right now, listen closely and clearly. When I say a functionally mobile quarterback, I'm not talking about rushing yards. I'm talking about being able to make plays off schedule, being able to move the pocket, escape pressure when you have to, because when you have a quarterback who's not as mobile, he's just got to take the sack or throw it away. When you have a mobile quarterback, it doesn't necessarily have to run for 20 rushing yards, but he can evade pressure, buy some time, and extend plays. Extending plays and evading pressure. That's what a functionally mobile quarterback can do. So you could put Matthew Stafford in this category. Yes, Matthew Stafford has functional mobility. Joe Burrow gets hurt, but he had a wrist injury. He didn't get hurt on getting hit. His first calf injury was a non-contact injury, so it had nothing to do with mm-hmm. him getting hit or running around. Functionally mobile quarterback. Trevor Lawrence, who barely misses games. Functionally mobile quarterback. So, again, these quarterbacks that don't necessarily run for 100 yards in the game, but they can extend plays and buy receivers time downfield so they can make plays and throw downfield. It's not about rushing yards, and that's what the Raiders need at the quarterback position. I wrote a piece on Sports Not saying the Raiders need to add athleticism to their quarterback room. You saw that on display. There are multiple, there are multiple times where Aiden O'Connell just had to eat the sack because he couldn't move, and when he did move, he wasn't accurate. Right, right, and and that's what I said. I I looked at the sacks, and with the exception of a few, uh, some of them were on him too because he can't release the ball quick enough. Now you expect that a little bit with a rookie. But you also have to look at that and say, okay, that means he's got to develop that. And that's going to take time. The Raiders don't have time to wait three years uh, with a guy back there, a quarterback. They have to get somebody who's going to do that. And 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 people will argue till they're blue in the face about this, Mo, because they've been doing it with you and I for the last two weeks about, about stationary quarterbacks. People like Aiden O'Connell who don't move very well in the pocket. Well, if he had a better offensive line. No. Listen. I know they're struggling right now, but the Philadelphia Eagles, Jalen Hurts, is a functionally mobile quarterback, right? He can run if he has to, but nonetheless, he moves in the pocket. They have prob- arguably the best offensive line in the NFL, right? I think I'm pretty safe in saying that. And he mm-hmm. still needs to do it. It's just the way the NFL is today, the way it is with defenses, the way it is with the talent and and the ability, the athletic ability of, of, of guys that are playing linebacker with size and speed. It's a whole different ball game. And if you look at it, you can point to all the quarterbacks who won the Super Bowl that were pocket passers. No question about it, including those recently. But that time has flipped. It's changed. It's going away. Tell me what quarterback who's a pocket passer right now, Mo, who's going to win the Super Bowl. Who? Exactly. And for the for the pocket passing crowd out there, Jared Goff against the Bears defense, which is significantly better now than it was in the first half of the season. Jared Goff took four sacks. How did Jared Goff look on Sunday <laughs> against the Bears defense? Tell me, how did how did Jared Goff look? Uh, yes. Anyone out there listen to me who who says the Raiders uh, could get a pocket pass a quarterback and still – and look, there are outliers out there, and Tom Brady is the ultimate outlier because a lot of people like to bring up Tom Brady when they say the Raiders don't need a functionally mobile quarterback. You're using the outlier to prove your point, which proves my point. I'm the greatest quarterback ever. <laughs> you're yeah. ch- Right. When you're when you're trying to prove your point, you don't use the outlier. Tom Brady, arguably the best quarterback in NFL history. Tell me how many quarterbacks are coming out of the sixth round pocket passers start in their first full year and win a Super Bowl. Give me the list of quarterbacks other than Tom Brady who've done that, because that's what you're saying that the Raiders should find in the, in, the, in the draft. That's what you're saying. The Raiders have to get in the pocket passing quarterback. That's not coming along anytime soon. You know what it is coming into the NFL? And so, and I would say in droves, but you know what is coming to, into the NFL at a high volume? Functionally mobile quarterbacks. I've responded to someone on the X this past week. I said 11 of the 12 teams that made the playoffs, 11 of the 11 or 12 of the teams that made the playoffs last year, the 14, had functionally mobile quarterbacks. I believe Jared Goff, not Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins was one of the exceptions, right? And the Vikings went actually went further in the playoffs with Case Keenum. Before Kirk Cousins got there, Case Keenum is a more functionally mobile quarterback than Kirk Cousins. As Viking fans, how they feel about Kirk Cousins? Because some of them want to run him out of Minnesota, by the way. Yes. Because they say he can only take them, but so far. And I'm saying a lot of people want to say Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom Brady. 
other than Tom Brady, who we just said is the outlier because six round picks aren't coming out in droves starting and winning Super Bowls, multiple Super Bowls. Well, <laughs> other, look at the quarterbacks who've been in the Super Bowl. Joe Burrow. I brought up Matthew Stafford, functionally mobile quarterback. Jalen Hurts, functionally mobile quarterback. It, it's not hard to figure out the formula. The league has changed, folks. I'm surprised. You know, I, Scott, I was naturally surprised that when I brought up the word, the term functionally mobile quarterback, people responded to me like general managers in the 1960s. <laughs> and it's like, do you people not watch the league? Do you, are you not watching Josh Allen? And it's like, it's like people believe that if you are a functioning mobile quarterback, that you have no pocket presence. And to that point, I bring up Trevor Lawrence, functioning mobile quarterback who's good in the pocket. Joe Burrow, functioning mobile quarterback who's good in the pocket. Now, again, people want to say, well, he's hurt right now. Again, that calf injury he had, non-contact injury. That wrist injury he had, he had the injury. He re-aggravated against the Ravens in that game. So it had nothing to do with him getting hit. Don't bring up the excuses and people say, well, Lamar Jackson gets hurt. Lamar Jackson is one of the top dual threat, I would say, dynamic quarterbacks. He runs the ball a lot, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking no. about a quarterback who only runs if he has to. If he well, has to run, he has that option. Great, but he's a pocket passer. Well, what's interesting, too, when you look at that argument, when we talk about the quarterbacks, we talk about Aiden O'Connell not being functionally mobile. Even going back seven years when you look at Super Bowl winners, okay, you have Patrick Mahomes, functionally mobile, wins two of them. The Rams win in 2022 with Matthew Stafford, Matthew right? Stafford, functionally mobile. But he's functionally mobile. People don't think of him that way, but he is. Right. He, he is. He makes but, plays out of the pocket all the time. When people say Matthew Stafford isn't functionally mobile, it lets me know they haven't watched Matthew Stafford. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's all it, it lets me know you haven't watched Matthew Stafford play football because he can extend plays and move the pocket. Right. So so you go back. So the last two you have you have two. You have Mahomes, you have Stafford. Then the year before that was Tom Brady, then Mahomes before that, then Tom Brady. Okay. Then the year before that in Philadelphia, but you had the the duel of of, of Carson Wentz. Carson right? Wentz and then Phils. And before that, you had Tom Brady. You getting the theme here? Uh, and right. then before that was Denver, right? Who won with John Elway? I'm sorry, Peyton Manning? <laughs> Peyton Manning. <laughs> Not John Elway. Peyton Manning. And then before that, mm -hmm. Tom Brady. And then before that, Russell Wilson. What is he? So, so again, so, uh, so arguing that we'll look at the last nine Super Bowls. Yeah, they were all Tom Brady. Sack six of them. Six of them were Tom Brady. So, so, so basically, Scott, what you're telling me is, the Raiders just need to find Tom Brady. arguably one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time in the function in a pocket passing quarterback will work. That, right. That, if they get all the greatest to quarterback to ever play the game again, who's better than Tom Brady, who wins eight Super Bowls instead of six, then right. then then they'll have what they need. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that that's that's the easy route to, you know, find a quarterback. Yeah, just wait till the sixth round, get a pocket passing guy, he'll turn into Tom Brady, right? Yeah. Right. Who but that's the other thing, and 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 I get in I get in disagreements with discussions on is no you got to build the lines first and listen I, I say it all the time Mo offensive deep the trenches you have to win in the, if you look at the good teams they win in the trenches now you've seen Kansas City fall off of course they lost again Sunday Sunday to the Bills that offensive line hasn't done well this year the defensive line's doing great so they have a little bit of imbalance the Eagles struggling the last several weeks. But if you look at them, their lines are both very, very good, and they improved the defensive line with Jalen Carter. We know how that went. So I get that piece of it. But in the NFL, if you if you saw it this year with all the injuries and having more starting quarterbacks than any year in NFL history, if you don't have a quarterback, you could have the best lines in the world, and you're not going to win because you don't score points. That's why people criticize the Raiders' offensive line. And, yes, it has to be better. No question. We've said that for, what, two years? But mm -hmm. they've had a good enough offensive line where if they had a quarterback who made plays, they win the game yesterday. They maybe stay closer in the Chief game. I don't know. Right? The Miami game they might win. I mean, these are things you have to look at and say, the difference in having a quarterback. It is a quarterback league. If you want to stay in denial and think that it's not, I respect that, but you're wrong. Cleveland for years has had a top-notch offensive line, and they didn't really start to get buzzed. Now they had the Sean Watson who got hurt, 
But Cleveland's had a top offensive line for years, and it didn't mean anything until they got the strong Watson and people started saying, well, maybe Cleveland has a chance to make the playoffs. And they're still, they still have a chance to make the playoffs, and they got Joe Flacco playing well. But to your point, if you if your quarterback is not accurate, you have an inaccurate quarterback, or he's just not a playmaker at the position, takes a bunch of sacks, he can get all the blocking he needs. But he still has to make those passes to Devontae Adams, to Jacoby Myers, to Michael Mayer, to Trey Tucker, to Hunter Renfro, and those guys. So, and, and I go back to my general point is I strongly dis, I strongly dislike this either or thing. So when it comes to the quarterback position, it's like if the quarterback is functionally mobile, then he can't be good from the pocket, which is false because we see it all over the league. Guys who can move and throw from the pocket. And this notion that, oh, well, if the Raiders get a quarterback, then they can't address the offensive line. I said this two weeks ago. They can get their quarterback in the first round and still address their offensive line issues. You don't address one position per year, right? You try to fix multiple holes in one offseason. Right. You got free agency to do that. You got other draft picks to do that. You can acquire draft picks and trade plays. There's so many things that you can address in the offseason. You don't address just one position and go, okay, we got our quarterback. We don't need to do anything else. No, you draft your quarterback in the first round and the second and third round you get an offensive lineman or if you don't like any of the second or third round offensive linemen you sign one in free agency i don't think this is that hard to figure out you address multiple positions in one off season it's not just a one-off thing no and they do they need to uh there's a lot of positions they need to address and and that's why when i when i was having the discussion earlier in the season people oh we're only a couple players away on defense no well well we just need on offense we just need a right tackle no <laughs> There's, there's a lot more there. Um, and you always get better. You want to try to get better. You want to try to get better in every position. Okay, we're going to try to get better. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll close out the show for this Tuesday. We hope you guys are enjoying your week thus far after just what was a terrible game to watch on Sunday. But that's okay. It's over with. Now you can put it behind you and move forward. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. It is Silver and Black today. Mo Moten, Scott Branson with you on this Tuesday for the home stretch here as we get set to uh, finish up the show with a discussion. Looking forward, yes, enough of the bitching and retroactive looking back at stuff that's happened or, or the deficiencies with the Raiders. Instead, we're going to look at uh, the last four weeks. And Mo, I think the last four weeks now, look, playoffs, nah, not going to happen. If you look at the final four games, you have the Chargers on this short week coming up in just two days from now on Thursday, which we will uh, preview Thursday morning. You can wake up, hear our show, and then get ready for the game that night. But when you when you look at the Chargers, then they have the uh, Chiefs, then the Colts, and then the Broncos, right? So you have these four games. To me... And I understand some of these guys feel as though they're still fighting for a coaching job, and that's fine. You, you still try to win games. It's the NFL. It's professional football. But I was disappointed yet again on Sunday when I saw the inactives, and I saw some of the young talent, Byron Young, Nesta Jade Silvera, some of these defensive linemen. Now, maybe, they are, maybe they're terrible, and we just don't see it. I don't know. I've seen them play preseason a couple games here and there during the season, and I've seen some pretty nice stuff. I think these last four games have to be about evaluating the talent. I know Champ Kelly doesn't have the job permanently, although I've advocated that he get that after interviewing. But I will say that if I'm Champ Ke Kelly, I have the, the conversation with my coach to say, hey, listen, we need to see what some of these kids got. I'm not saying that you just play them and, and, and let the games go away. What I mean, though, is I think you need to at least have some of these guys active to work them into a rotation to see what they have. You need film because when, when you switch in the offseason, whether it's coaches, whether it's GMs, whatever, whatever it is, you have to have some tape in real game action in games that matter to understand what you have. Are you on that page too? What else would you like to see as far as some of these young guys play so that they can be properly evaluated? Yeah, the Raiders have to, the coaching staff has to balance things. On one hand, you want to win football games because you're trying to get the job that you have right now, especially Antonio Pierce. But on the second, on second hand, maybe it's time to see a lot of these young guys because, especially Byron Young, he's a third round pick and he doesn't see the field. To me, that tells me that he is not good at practice, and that's what they're probably not telling. Of course, they're not going to throw the kid under the bus, but 
that that's what it indicates to me that he's just not performing well at practice. So if you're not performing well at practice, you're not going to see the field on game day. But let's remember Nesta J. Severa, there's a reason why he made the initial 53-man depth chart. Played well in the preseason. I know that's the preseason, but clearly the Raiders thought that he could contribute during the regular season. That's why he made the initial 53-man depth chart. I think it has to do with his criticism of the coaching staff after he finally got to play against the Giants, why he's not on the field. I think that explains that may explain his story. I'm not reporting that. That's just my guess. But I I, I agree with you, Scott, that you want to see what some of these younger guys have on the field because now you're looking toward 2024 and you're saying, okay, who's going to stay and who's going to go in the off season? Who could we? Who could possibly be a starter? Who can we possibly move or trade? Let's remember the Raiders traded Neil Farrell Jr. this past off season, so the Raiders felt like, okay, we can move on from this guy. We have other plays at the position. That's where you're evaluating right now in these last four games, even though the playoffs i know the raiders aren't mathematically eliminated but let's be real and honest they're not making the playoffs this year um so you're thinking again you're thinking long term i should say short long term where beyond the 2023 season who are keepers let's assume that's you know you're planning as if we're gonna we're gonna be here next year with the raiders who do we want to see on the roster and even if we're not here we give the next coaching staff, the next administration, a look at some of the young guys that could possibly keep or hold jobs or get promotions into starting roles or rotational spots next year. So you're also doing it for the players to give them a shot to show what they what they got and show their potential. Yes, uh, and I think that I think that everybody in the organization, other than you know a couple of the guys like Max Crosby, Devonte Adams, those guys, they don't have. I mean, you know what you have there. But I think mm-hmm. if I'm the owner, Mark Davis, too, I mean, look, everybody, I wrote a piece back last month about how Mark Davis needed to have a better approach to hiring when it comes to coaching and, and the GM. Uh, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, he needs good people advising him and he needs to stay out of the head coaching uh, search and all that stuff. Just let his GM hire them. And while I sort of agree with that, he's clearly not going in that direction. And he's the owner. He's going to have say in it. What? No matter what his record has been, which has not been very good, obviously, when it comes to winning football games and picking coaches that last in his time as, as owner, <clears throat> he's still going to do it. So with that said, I think he he needs to see, too. He needs to say, OK, these final four games, playoffs are off the table. We're not talking about that. We know we're not going to get there. But what we do know is that we have some young players. We need to see what they can do. We're starting to see Aiden O'Connell. Bad game. That's OK. Maybe he comes back against the Chargers on Thursday and has a better game. That's fine. But we need to see that. He's looking at his coaching staff too. So I think that you have to be able to evaluate that. For him, he needs to evaluate it. And if Champ Kelly does, <clears throat> excuse me, get the job full time, he needs to evaluate too. And so they have to get on the same page there. And I think you had the perfect word, which was balance. You have to balance winning football games. And if you're in a football game, great. Then you tr- you win it. Right. But at the same time, you can rotate guys in to see what you have. That's my point. And, and with your point with Nate, uh, Nesta Jade Silvera, I wonder if they've I, I, and, and Byron, Young, I wonder if they're done with them. And that's why they're not active, believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds. And if they are, that's fine. Whatever. It's an indictment on the previous regime, too, from a draft perspective. But and, and hey, yes, Silvera popped off on Instagram. I get it. But how long does he have to be in the doghouse for that? Like, I mean. A week or two, but I think we're now, what, on four weeks since that happened or five weeks since that happened? Yeah. So it was, it was so really it's like, okay, when is it punitive and when do you say, okay, you learned your lesson, now we're going to put you out there and see what you got. I mean, you got four games left. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And that's a good point about Champ Kelly because, remember, he was part of that previous regime along with Dave Ziegler and putting together draft classes and you know going out to free agents. So if you're Champ Kelly, and I think there's more of a chance to Chap Kelly keeps his job in Antonio Pierce because Mark Davis has come out and said he would have hired Champ Kelly had he not hired Joshua Daniels and Dave Ziggler as a package deal. If you're Champ Kelly, I think you're pushing to get those young guys on the field because, as you said, then you can evaluate some of the guys that you scouted and brought in and see what you got and then see what you will need in next year's draft. Now, Nesta, Jason, Vern, and Byron Young are not keeping you from drafting a high-end defensive tackle, in my opinion, at this point. Right. But you can find out if they're rotational players because a lot of those older guys like John Jenkins and Adam Butler, 
can you let those guys go and then rotating your younger guys who have a higher ceiling? And that's what you're trying to figure out in these last four games. Yeah. Yeah. You have to figure that out because um, I don't, I, while those guys have played pretty well. And again, the progress of the defense, the defense still ranked in the twenties, but they've improved. They've kept this team in games. That's why the piece I wrote up on, on, on sports, not yesterday, which I've been getting a little crap for is about uh, the Raiders offense being an albatross. Cause it has been the defense, the second half of the season, the defense has played well enough. I'm not, again, not not a, a an all-pro unit by any means, but they played well enough for this team to win more than more games, th- at least three more games, I think, than they have right now. I mean, the Raiders could be sitting with eight wins right now, believe it or not. They could very easily have done that. So when you look at that, it's, it's all on the offense, and so they're going to have to figure that out too, but, but it all starts with quarterback. Quick point, Scott, and I made this point on the X, and I said the one coach that's made the strongest case to stay on as as a coach on staff is Patrick Grant. Yes, it's clearly Patrick Grant, and people are saying, well, if you hire, if you don't keep AP, then you're probably going to get a new defensive coordinator. In most cases, that is true, but it's not unheard of for the for the for the successing regime to keep a previous coordinator. The Colts just did it. The Colts fired Frank Wright and Jeff Saturday. They had mm-hmm. Gus Bradley as the defensive coordinator. They hired Shane Steichen this past offseason, and guess what? They kept Gus Bradley. So if your head coach is on board with keeping a defensive coordinator who's showing improvement with his unit, I don't see why that should be out of the question. And, and the Raiders, a lot of people point this out there on my Bleach Report Live. The defense has been playing a lot better than it has in the past maybe decade outside of 2016 when they were top three in takeaways. This is the best we've seen the Raiders' defense. I mean, you can't do any more than what they did on Sunday against the Vikings. They held the Vikings at three points and still lost the football game. So, I mean, you got Robert Spillane having his best year. Max Crosby is is great as he is, but he's even he needs coaching. And then you have other guys who will make a play. Janarius Robinson, a uh, new Raider who came on, had a sack on Sunday. You know, against his, I believe that's his former team, played with the Vikings. I believe the Vikings drafted him. Yeah. So, there, there are players other than Max Crosby and Robert Spillane making plays, and I think kudos should go to uh, Patrick Graham. Now, the linebacker core, I gave credit to Antonio Pierce on that one. Now, if Antonio Pierce wants to stay with the Raiders as a position coach, fine, but that's not a guarantee either. But my, my point of keeping Patrick Graham is if you keep Patrick Graham, you don't have to start it over on defense. Now your players don't have to learn a new scheme with a new defensive coordinator because let me tell you, if a new defensive coordinator comes in, he may decide – Tyree Wilson doesn't fit my scheme. He may decide someone else on the back end that you trade that you're developing. Trayvon Merrick doesn't fit my scheme. So then you have to have some turnover on the defensive end. The Raiders need to fix their offense. If the Raiders fix their offense, they have a balanced team because their defense is playing pretty well. Right. So that's my point. You keep Patrick Graham, you keep that continuity, you keep Tyree Wilson, those guys developing, and you go and you fix your offense. Yeah, and I think I think that. And, and again, more people are worried about keeping Antonio Pierce than Patrick Graham when Patrick Graham is by far right now accomplished the most of any coach on that, that staff. Now, of course, Pat, uh, Antonio Pierce is part of that on the defense, so don't get me wrong. He right. has done that linebacking course played much better than I ever anticipated it could. It showed right. some of its uh, uh, um, slowness <laughs> against the Vikings at times, but overall it's done great. And you've seen players develop there, so, so kudos to Antonio Pierce for doing that on the defense. But I, I think there's a better chance of that happening, Mo, because I, I will look at this and say, Raiders are going to go get a quarterback in this draft. It's, it's going to be a priority. So to me, I think they're going to lean towards hiring an offensive-minded coach. That would right. the, An offensive-minded coach is going to be open to keeping a defensive coordinator unless it's his brother or somebody else he wants to bring with him because you know that's not their specialty. The Raiders need the most help right now on offense. And so I think that's where you're going to see the focus when it comes to to hiring a coach. So uh, yeah, I would love to see Patrick Graham come back and give him some more bodies, give him, uh, like you said, that de- interior defensive tackle. He doesn't have the other end that he hasn't developed. Tyree Wilson did play well against the Vikings. They moved him inside a lot. And I thought he mm-hmm. did much better there. And so, so maybe you, maybe he moves inside. Maybe he, that's where he ends up going and, and, or he's some sort of hybrid player and we'll see what happens, but that's what these next four games are for. I brought up in my sports night article not too long ago. I said I want to see them move Tyree Wilson around. Lo and behold, they had him over the, the shading the center against the Vikings, and and he had some production. I, and I said this. I said he's strong enough and quick enough to possibly beat interior guards who are usually slow footed, 
and he can get some pressure on the quarterback and get in the backfield. And, and you saw that on Sunday. So I think that was a good move for, for uh, Patrick Graham. But when it comes down to building a coach's staff, assuming the Raiders draft the quarterback, you want to make sure or you want to have the best possible opportunity for that quarterback to be successful. And you do that by putting offensive minds around him. And usually that means hiring an offensive minded head coach. And I know a lot of Antonio Pierce people don't want to hear that, but are you, are you more focused on keeping Antonio Pierce because he's a Raider through and through or developing, uh, developing a quarterback who can possibly get you to the playoffs and elevate this franchise. And I think it should be the latter. Now, if Antonio, again, if Antonio Pierce wants to stay on as a position coach, great. He's done well, with the linebackers, if Patrick sure Graham wants to stay on as the, as the defensive coordinator, great. He's developed a pretty good defense, but that's not a guarantee. The primary, the primary objective is get your quarterback and develop them because that's the key to get into the playoffs and hopefully the Super Bowl. Absolutely. Well, there you go. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of Silver and Black today. Mo, tell everybody what you got coming this week. Uh, as we talk to people on Tuesday, I know we have the game on Thursday. Let everybody know what you're up to. Yeah, short turnaround because the Rams play the Chargers Thursday night. I will have a Bleacher Report live on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 Pacific. I will go live before the Chargers game on Thursday and after the Chargers game on Thursday, breaking down that matchup and what it could be. Josh Jacobs banged up, Justin Herbert banged up. So I don't mm -hmm. know what we're going to get on Thursday. That's going to be an interesting game. And then I'm going to have a live on Friday just to, just to kind of clean up what we saw on Thursday and looking ahead to the final three games. So it's a, it's a heavy Bleacher Report live week this week, and I will have a sports night piece, uh, piece coming up to be determined what the topic will be. There you go. See, it's surprises, surprises for everybody out there. Uh, and yeah, we'll try We're going to be with the short week. We're going to try to get a mailbag <clears throat> edition out for Wednesday. If we do not, we will definitely speak to you on Thursday morning with a full show leading into that Charger game. We'll see what happens between now and then. They're gonna, it's a quick turnaround. We'll see the quarterback position. Does Pierce make a change at starter? I don't think he will. I, I wouldn't advocate for it uh, like I would advocate for if it's a close game and you need someone to come in and, and just get a spark uh, with Garoppolo. I would have done that against the Vikings, but I think you keep O'Connell against the Chargers. And we'll see what we get, right? We'll see what we get at home again, another home game for the Raiders um, against the Chargers. And those are, they're always tight games. So we'll see what, what happens and what they're able to do. In the meantime, do us a favor, make sure you subscribe as well to the show, wherever you get your audio. Uh, check out Mo's work, not only on Bleacher Report, but as he mentioned on Sports Night. You can also check mine out if you missed my piece yesterday on the Raiders offense. Go check it out on sportsnot.com. And we will talk to you Thursday. Mo, my friend, I will talk to you then. Talk to you soon. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Mo Moten, I am Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey original podcast. We'll talk to everybody on Thursday. Bye-bye.